Rub up your engines! Danny Bennett said, I got an 03 CRV, 95,000 miles. A scam. It has a blown head gasket. and unsafe to drive was the diagnosis. My dad bought as is on a Sunday and a holiday. I have proof others were scanned by the same place. Any law advice? Okay. Here's the thing. If you say place and you bought it at a car lot, professional car sellers are responsible for pre-existing conditions. Period. They sold you a car with a blown head gasket. They didn't have to give you your money back or fix it. That's 30 days. It's law in most places. Ask a lawyer in your area what the local laws are. Here in Texas, that's the law. I had a customer do that once. They sold him a junkie car and he hired a lawyer. You know what they did? They just said, here, here's your money back. They didn't want to get involved any further. He bought a used car for like eight grand and then the engine was blown. Brought it to me and I said, hey, you know, they're responsible for pre-existing conditions at a car lot. That's, that's why car lots are bonded, see, at least in the state of Texas. They're bonded with these big bonds. So if they screw anybody over, then the money will come out of the bond. And of course, the bond guys, they'll come after the used car lot to get their money back too. They're no fools. But they pay for these bonds and they have to. If you sell more than a certain amount of cars in the state of Texas, legally, you have to get a used car dealer license and be bonded for that very reason. If you screw anybody over, there'll be money to pay the people that were screwed over. Sebastian Bard says, Scotty, urgent. I'm supposed to pick up my Mitsubishi Outlander Sport 2019 with a CVT. Should I actually buy it? No. <laughs> if you didn't put any money down and didn't sign any contracts, don't buy that thing. They don't hold up that well. Unless you got a fantastically cheap deal because it's a 2019. Every single customer of mine who bought an Outlander hated it in the end. They bought them new, they liked them for a while, then when they fell apart they're like, eh. And if you get a used one with high mileage, you're just asking for trouble. But, you know, unless you got a fantastic deal, I would not. I'd walk and find something else. Mark Strager says, what do you think of an Audi A6 2001 1.8 turbo? I think it's one of the biggest money pits that anybody ever made. I've had customers buy those things. Oh, man, did they have problems with those things. Uh, my neighbor had one. It was a standard transaction. Transmission. I said, smart move. Their automatics are kind of weak, but the standards are strong. Guess what happened? His transmission blew up. <laughs> he was just driving it, and it just exploded, and pieces came out of it. <laughs> And the turbo engines, they burn up. I'm amazed that a uh, 2001 is still driving down the road. Now, maybe if it was an older man, a German man who really maintained his vehicles and didn't drive like a maniac, might still be running. But hey, they're endless money pits from almost everybody else. You drive them hard, they're going to fall apart, especially when they're 19 years old. Corvette Geek says, I got a vibration in my 03 Silverado. 70 plus mile an hour, 130,000. Tire bouncing shock, something else. I've seen that happen before. And if your tires are balanced and the shocks are okay, and the rims are aren't bent. Go to a very good front end alignment shop. Have them check your alignment because occasionally if your alignment's off, it will get a speed wobble that at higher speeds will start to shake. But you're saying the vibration is in the steering wheel. Say if it's in the body of the vehicle, I know Silverados and that one's 17 years old. When the transmission starts to go out, it'll vibrate just like that. You got to pinpoint where the vibration is coming. And if it's the transmission, then you got to say, are you going to put thousands of that old thing or are you going to get rid of it? Connie White says, Scotty, whenever it's cold, my brake light comes on. For some reason, when it heats up, the brake light goes away. Do you know why? I got a Tacoma. Okay, I can tell you probably what it is. You're low on brake fluid. There's a brake fluid float in the reservoir. And when it gets low, the float goes below a certain parameter and that makes the brake light come on. But as you drive, it gets hot under the engine compartment and the fluid gets hot. It expands a little and the light goes off. So go under the hood, take the cap off, pour in some brake fluid. And then if the light goes off, you can thank Scotty for fixing your truck without even getting near it. <laughs> I see that all the time though. Joe Town says, Scotty, I'm thinking about buying an 05 Mercury Mariner for 2800 Mostly rust-free, has 131,000 miles. What's your thought on the Mariner? Oh, they're okay vehicles. It's uh, 15 years old and has 131,000 miles. Uh, I'd offer them two. <laughs> they can be okay. You never know. I mean, you got to road test it. Drive it on the highway. See how it shifts. Make sure when you're done, park it idly and look under it. Make sure there's no oil dripping from anything leaking and have a scan tool to scan stuff. But they can be decent vehicles, but I wouldn't offer for more than two for that old thing. Homer S says, 2003 Buick LeSabre, is that a good beater car? If you get it cheap enough and it still runs and shifts good, 
Sure, they were decent cars. Those, those V6 engines were pretty strong engines. Now the trannies were a little bit weak, but if driven by say an older man or an older woman that don't beat them, yeah, I've seen them go 150, 160,000 miles and still work right. But if they're driven by people that are really hard and put their pedal to metal all the time, the transmissions will wear out. So before you buy it, at least drive it around for 10, 15 minutes, see how the transmission goes, and if it shudders and shakes and doesn't, don't buy it. Travis Johnson says, Scotty, I got a 2012. Ford Focus, the reverse went out the other day. Worked for a tow company, our mechanic used a snap on scanner, it shows no codes. What could it be? Worth keeping? Probably not, because generally on those, they've got those stupid dual clutch transmissions that cost a fortune. But contact Ford. They got some kind of deal going on. There's a class action suit against them, and I think they might have settled it. And that they say they're going to fix them free for a certain mileage or time. And if it covered of that, call them up with the VIN number. If they say it's covered, tow it over there and let them fix it. But if you got to pay for it, not worth fixing. Those dual clutch transmissions cost many, many thousands to fix. And a lot of guys, they don't even know how to fix them. I had a guy last year get one fixed at a tranny shop, and then he brought it to me. He says, look, it's not shifting. I said, yeah, garbage. And he said, well, I paid this guy this much money to fix it. I said, take it back. He didn't fix it right. He took it back, and they got it back again. It still didn't work right. The guy didn't know what he was doing. So, I mean, if Ford fixes it free, great. If not, I'd say get rid of it. Andrew Guinea says, 2009 Volkswagen CC. It's blowing head gasket three times less than 30,000 miles. Why? Cooey! Well, Volkswagens, they make a lot of junk these days, but even for Volkswagen, that's got to be some kind of record. What's probably happening is the guys doing a head gasket job either aren't doing it or lying to you, and I've seen that many times, or they're just doing a crappy job. Head gasket jobs are insanely complex jobs. Everything has to be done perfectly, and when you pull the head off of the block to put the gasket in, you have to make sure both the block of the engine and the head of the engine are whistle clean. They have to be clean perfectly so the head gasket seals right and you can't just sit there with a scraper and scrape you'll make scratches then they won't seal right so many things can go wrong in a job like that these days most people don't even bother with head gasket jobs when it goes they just junk the car or they put another engine in because there's so many ancillary problems that can occur when a head gasket's blown and nobody wants to spend three four grand so they'll go to some cheap guy they'll say oh I can do it for eight hundred dollars well he doesn't do it right for eight hundred dollars but I think it's probably if they do actually do the work they're just doing shoddy work on it. Dwayne Lasseter says, what do you think about a 1968 Camaro? Well, back in those days, they made pretty good muscle cars. You know, they were really strong muscle cars. I'm assuming you're talking about a V8. The six-cylinder ones, yeah, they're kind of crappy, didn't have that much get up and go, but the V8s, they were the muscle car to have. You know, you want a Mustang or a Camaro, or back in those days, a Dodge Charger with big old V8s in them. And that, of course, is a collector's item. If you want to collect one, it's not a smart car to buy these days and use an everyday driver. One, it's made for super high test gasoline that you can't even buy these days so it wouldn't even run right it was made for leaded gasoline too but as a collector's car it's a nice car Ron Cox says what do you think of the Audi A3 1.5 cylinder on demand engine it's a marvel of technology but wait until it breaks. Just like the Germans and their Panzer tanks. They were great tanks, but they couldn't go 100 kilometers before something big broke and it would take them days to fix them. Audi having an on-demand engine, I just can't wait to see the stuff that breaks on them and how much money it's going to cost to fix those things. It's just, you know, they're all trying to get better gas mileage and all that nonsense, but you got an engine that shuts off things and go, I can't wait to see what happens to those because most of the other on-demand engine, the modern ones, what happens is for some reason they wear the engines because when you something about turning the power off to one, they scrape more and the metal to metal contact is more than if they've got the gasoline and are running normally. So me, I wouldn't use a vehicle like that. Domestic guy says, Canada is cold, burr. I normally plug in my Ford Focus when it's minus 16 Celsius or colder, but if it's minus 15 overnight and the windshield minus 30, is my car affected by the windshield? Do I need to plug it in? I'd plug it in. And there's various reasons I could plug it in, but you know, you have a Ford Focus and you're in cold weather. Even here in Houston, we have problems with them as they age the plastic cracks and has problems. You're a lot colder there. Your vehicle is still going to run at the same temperature it is here because it's controlled. You watch your temperature gauge. It runs in the middle, so the engine's getting just as hot when it's cold out there as it is here when it's warm because the coolant keeps the engine at the regular temperature. So it's the same temperature here as it is there. But you're getting much colder than here. All that cold and then getting to the same operating temperature, the plastic cracks even more up there. So the warmer you can keep that thing, the better. Because eventually, if you keep that focus long, all that plastic crap's going to start breaking and cracking, and you're going to wish you didn't buy the car. So yeah, for you, keep it as warm as possible, because that coal eventually is going to destroy that plastic, and half of that vehicle is made out of plastic under the hood.
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.